Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Helen Payne. So Helen, I've been hearing about for years. Um, she is a professor at Hertfordshire University. She's doing a lot of work around something called medically unexplained symptoms. Uh, she's a real expert in dance movement therapy and has written a whole bunch of books on that, including a few of which are on my shelves. Um, she's got a very rich background in therapy and a whole bunch of things. And um, I kind of think of her as the John Callot Zinn of movement. So um, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And so we've, we've got a mutual student in Uslem from Turkey and yes, she's got to connect us for years and we finally managed it. So um, that's good. Yeah. Um, I normally start with people at the beginning of their journey. So how did you get interested in the body? What was the beginning of your journey? I was always very active as a child, physical. I, my mother was a ballerina and of course I had to go to ballet class, which I didn't really engage with too much until. I left, I think, when I was about 13 or 14, I sort of rebelling against that formality and the kind of the classical style. Um, and then when I went to um, study physical education to train in a secondary school for girls PE, I found dance again, but it was creative dance. It was love and dance, which was much more to my liking. Um, it involved group work, it involved creativity, it involved process, dynamics. It was much more engaging I think for for me um, and it was really from that point that I got more interested in dance as a as a form of um, expression and uh, <clears throat> a form of uh, therapy thereafter. Um, I found myself working in um, educational priority area in a comprehensive school and we had dance in our um, break you know lunch break that's a dance club and a lot of kids came to that and we just had great fun you know making up dances to their pop music um and then I found myself in a special school as a movement specialist from three to 18 working with a whole range of emotional behavioral disorders and autism and um learning disabilities and it was from there that I started experimenting with movement as a, a form of therapy and um especially with the non-verbal the non the children who hadn't got much expressive language using uh, movement as a way of promoting uh, a relationship between myself and the the child the young person to kind of you know get into some kind of a space together yeah where we could Stand each other and mutually um, be together uh, so they didn't feel so alone and uh, it was very rewarding work and then I went on to work with um, young offenders adolescent young boys who who'd been labeled in those days delinquent young offenders in uh, lockups and so on um, and I, I just learned so much so much from these these different client groups now I, now I work more with adults so but uh, having worked with such challenging children and young people it could have been good stead for the for the adult really <laughs> yeah if you could work with challenging young people and you can work with anyone I've come through a sort of similar background in some ways and so let's lend it occurs to me this word dance is kind of loaded you know in the people come either with a mentality of partner dance like courtship dance or mm. kind of being drunk at a nightclub mm. and you know my guess is what you're doing doing is pretty different from those two things um, and it seems like sometimes that word dance, do you call what you do dance therapy or dance movement therapy or just movement therapy? Because I know that there's sort of different terminologies out there. Yeah, yeah there are. And, you know, the dance, dance therapy very much in America, dance movement psychotherapy in the UK, dance movement therapy in, the, in Europe, movement therapy in, uh, I think, Australia and also um, movement therapy in China, but creative movement therapy in India. <laughs> Wow. So, it, yeah, very many different ways, but it's it's basically the same thing. It rose by any other name type thing. It's 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 working with the expressive movement um, as opposed to stylized uh, formal dance. It's working with the expressive movement, which if you were flying the wall and you saw that movement between two people or in a group, you 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 could say it was a dance and a, a dance of relationship. Mm. So Howard, let's start right at the beginning because the audience are coming from incredibly mixed backgrounds. If so, you're at a party, you're a bit drunk, 
music's loud someone says what do you do for a living what's this dance therapy thing that you do how would you describe that in like super simple terms super simple super simple terms would be um the movement moment really the work you know the therapeutic alliance is through the movement moment with the, with the client um using movement as the medium for the therapeutic alliance and from that issues can emerge within that within that relationship which can be addressed non-verbally as well as verbally um, because many many issues such as trauma can be pre-verbal issues so we don't necessarily have the language we don't we can't necessarily identify through through language um, to heal ourselves of the, of the trauma so the pre-verbal experience is very much held in the body and that can be worked with in a, in a non-verbal way, more productively and more effectively. Yeah, what you're answering, I'm starting to answer, is the question of why the body? Why not just talk therapy, right? Mm. Like, you know, one answer is some people can't talk, like, uh, you know, verbal, uh, some of the groups you talked about before. Another answer is, yeah, people can talk, but their trauma's at a pre-verbal level, so you need to yeah. work at that level. Another yeah. answer might just be, hey, we just connect better at that level. There's a reason yeah. you can't in the other sense, you know? Um, are there any other answers to that like like question of like hey why the body because that's, that's yeah. weird if people are used to talk therapy I think I think in my experience because I've also trained in talking therapy in my experience some people will intellectualize and over intellectualize if you like their their issues and it becomes almost like the the, the verbalization becomes almost like a defense doesn't help Where, does it just talking around and around and around yeah, around and around and lots of stories and oh, and no, no yeah just analyzing everything but really where does that get you um whereas if you go into a space and move it you know you, it's direct it's a direct experience of the self direct is a nice word for it isn't it like one of my teachers when they're working in business they say this is a shortcut and that's a great mm. way to write it to business mm. direct and, I, and and as you say there's some things you just can't get at and i i feel like we actually all know this right like we all know the body matters in that way and somehow it's been forgotten and, and, you know, it seems strange to be doing this. Okay, so you're, you're a proper academic. There's a ridiculous number of books behind you that people can't see listening to the podcast. <laughs> uh, like, at proper university, all that. One of the few academics we've had on. How is it to be a body person in academia? Uh, it's difficult. It's very difficult that because in academia, the body is completely negated and, and, the, and language is privileged. Right. So, so say what you mean by language is privilege. Let's let's make that in real simple language. What does that mean? It means that people in specifically in academia, cognition and language and thinking is all privileged. Is all um, seen as you know the way forward. The, the things that we do are all matters, right? Yeah. But whereas the body is very much on the margins and not really, not really thought about. Not. Really, it's a bit like the unconscious, you know, not really, although we, we are getting more into raising people's consciousness through this whole thing of unconscious bias, which is becoming more fashionable. And also mindfulness is becoming, I've just been invited to do a session at the university actually, because I've, I've done a few sessions in, um, in mindfulness, but what I do is incorporate moving mindfully. So yeah, we might do a few sitting things, but a lot of it is about, being in the movement moment whereby we pay attention to the movement yeah within. I, I, so, you know, I think embodiment is going to get known as moving mindfulness even though I think it's more yeah. than that because that yeah. from the door and it's made my life so much easier in the business world for example to talk about definitely definitely and then building on Kabat-Zinn's work you mentioned him earlier you know building on that for the stress reduction um, of course, movement is immediately a release of stress because you are moving, you are mobilizing. Yeah. Whereas when you're sitting still, you're containing and you could get into that frozen state even, you know, because it's a non-mobile, it's not, it's non-mobilizing. It's, it's a non-mobile state of being. Whereas in the movement, you're constantly relieving that, you know, so you can actually release some stress through moving it. Yeah, I, mean, I just, before we started recording, I said to you, you know, don't be alarmed if I stand up and move around during the podcast, which I kind of say a standard to all my guests, because, you know, I'm doing three yeah. podcasts today, like that's three hours of sitting down, plus another two or three hours of email. I just, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I feel, yeah, right. I feel terrible when I do that. So, so I've got this great mic that I can move up and down, like, you know, stand up. And stretch. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's like it would be crazy doing an embodiment podcast sat in one place the whole time. Um, so those that don't know listening, John Kabat-Zinn got kind of famous for doing evidence-based studies on mindfulness-based stress reduction. So yeah. he took yeah. this beautiful Buddhist practice that he had and knew many great teachers and, and kind of packaged it in a socially acceptable, westernized form. And it's an eight-week course and then was able to do research on it. So instead of just intuitively saying, well, meditation seems kind of good for you, he was able to sort of do some proof and some evidence base and say, well, what we found is a 20% reduction in anxiety or 50% reduction in depression in these clinical studies. And that was really great, really, you know, um, really new. Like when I first heard about it, it was like, wow, this is because I had a scientific education and I did meditation mm. and that was new. And mm. I don't mind the comparison because basically tell me if I'm wrong, what I've heard is you're doing similar things with movement. Exactly that. Exactly that. We're building on, if you like, the, the, the platform that kabat gave us, we're building on that and we're working with, within the movement frame as opposed to within the stillness frame. Not that we aren't also able to do things in the stillness frame. That's, that's fine as well. And I mean, when I'm working with patients with medically unexplained symptoms, the body awareness um, practices that, that we do is starts off with people simply sitting and mindfully paying attention to where the sensation pleasurable or not so pleasurable is in their body and noticing that and then taking their kind attention and placing it there and just staying with that for a moment and just see what happens yeah when they're placing their kind attention in that place and then finding an opposite sensation somewhere else in the body, pleasant or unpleasant body and, and repeating that. And just that in itself raises people's consciousness of, of their body in a very different way from when they experience their body with the symptoms day yeah. to day. And it's, you know, any embodiment movement is based on being able to feel, right? So it has to start with mindfulness. I always say it's mindfulness and, mm. I'm explaining embodiment, mm. you know, it's mindfulness and we might move with that, or as you said, do the opposite of that or express mm. it more or less. So we then play with that proactively, but the beginning is always the tuning in. Yes, yeah, so that's where we would start with, uh, with people with these uh, quite distressing symptoms like fibromyalgia, IBS, chronic fatigue, these sorts of symptoms, non-cardiac, chest pain, breathing problems, all of these very common symptoms. Um, That's where we would start. But then we would take that a step further and use symbol or metaphor for exploring the symptoms. So, So noticing the sensation in the body is one part. So having that internal consciousness of what it feels like in the body with this kind of kind benign attitude towards the symptom which is very different from how they normally feel towards the symptom which is the enemy cut it out get rid of it fix it you know push it away um it's much more of a you know let's befriend the symptom let's kind of contain it let's bring it closer to us even which is it sounds counterintuitive isn't it it's the it's last thing i know from martial arts the more you yeah. run away from pain the more it hurts and the more you get you know, the, the, the the journey of having had over ten thousand wrist locks on me in my life is that after a while you start you start first accepting and then even yeah exactly really it's compassionate acceptance that's what we're that's the goal really um because because what we're doing is providing a space for people to learn how to self-manage their symptoms as opposed to treating or curing um yeah there's, their a few, there's a few avenues here there's so much good stuff and i've literally been waiting for years to talk to you so it's, it's super <laughs> cool i mean why did you choose medically unexplained symptoms maybe you could say a little bit um, for example i've heard of fibromyalgia not fibro but but i don't know much about it this is the kind of stuff that doctors go well i don't know what to do with it exactly you know, you're really That's what suffering. The that's one of the reasons I selected this right. particular bunch of people because really um, there's a whole bunch of people that are on the margins of the medical profession. People don't, the medics uh, don't know what to do with them. As you say, yeah. they, they keep going to the GP and they keep having all these tests and scans and they even have operations. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very, very difficult problem for GPs who are there to fix people who are yeah. there to explain a diagnosis and then to give a treatment. And of yeah. course, these symptoms, they a, don't have a diagnosis, although they sometimes look similar to, to a diagnosis. They're not that particular diagnosis. And, and B, the, 
the GP doesn't have anywhere to uh, to send them apart from mental health services. So the person thinks, oh, not only have I got these body symptoms, they don't know what's wrong with me, but now they think I've got a mental health problem as well. Yeah. <laughs> so they've got to, and so they get treatment for mental health, like depression, antidepressants, because of course yeah. they're going to be depressed if they're in pain all day. Then they um, then they have CBT or something like that to sort of manage their belief systems. But they're never they're their symptoms and the actual bodily experience, the lived day to day body experience, is never addressed. Yeah. So and it's so they're, they're told it's all in their mind, and it was called psychosomatic symptoms. Yeah. That's what it used to be called. Patients absolutely hate that word. Yeah. And the term is still used in some of the medical professions. There still is a journal called psychosomatic. Um, psychosomatic research, I think it's called, or psychosomatic medicine. It sounds like they're making it up, right? It's, yeah, they fear that people think they're just making it up or it's all in their head and they're going crazy. And when they refer to mental health services, they think they really do think I'm crazy. Ellen, can you slow down a little bit? Because a lot of, and I'm, I'm a terror for this myself, but a lot of okay. our audience are English second language. I've been told off for this by my audience. Okay. Myself. Slow down, slow down. I share your enthusiasm for this. And I, you know, I've had students who are really suffering and they were just being, you know, Dr. Eva said, well, there's nothing we can do, deal with it. And then left the question of how. Um, or they were told, you know, you know, you're making up, you're mad, or you're attention seeking. And they, you know, these are people I really trust, one. And they were genuinely suffering. So, you know, my, my sense is that was a good opening for body, mind, practice in the same way as for Kabat-Zinn, depression and anxiety was a good yeah. opening. Yeah. Like, you know, and yeah. um, was that sort of basically why you chose it? You thought, okay, this is something I can really help with. Uh, well, that's yeah. exactly right. Cause, because I was, my boss at the time, I w I'd finished my PhD and I was looking around for a postdoc sort of area of interest. Um, and I'd done all my publishing for my PhD. And I thought, what am I going to do next? So I was thinking, what, what is it that we can offer from dance movement psychotherapy? What is it that we can offer to help people with? And then I came across this term psychosomatic and I thought, psychosoma, you know, body, mind, body, mind. Let's let's see if we can make more of a link between body, mind. And then I saw, of course, Western you know, medicine is, you know, bodies over there, physical health and emotional health if you like mental health is over there and never the twain do actually meet mm. um so we're very much split um and of course we don't have a word for for um sort of the lived body like in german we have a uh, lieb l-i-e-b yeah is, is so the, yeah the lived body it's the lived body the subjective body we ha we sort of treat our body more as an object to get fit or an object to fix or but, but the way i look at it is that the, the it's the lived body that the, the person's symptoms come within the lived body they have a day-to-day -day yeah. experience of their body which is distressing very yeah. distressing as yeah. you say you know they're really suffering and there wasn't anything out there for them apart from as i say for a couple of symptoms a couple of uh, particular symptoms cbt had had a moderate uh, moderate effect so i thought well maybe this is an area where we can offer something. Yeah. So that's why I did the, I did the research and I got funded to do the research and um, it seemed to work. And then we were funded to do some deliveries in the NHS in primary care and that mirrored the results of the research. Now so, I know you're both British and an academic, so you're likely to be very modest. So if you just imagine your American personal growth speaker, I, I imagine it didn't just sort of work. My sense is that you've actually developed a pretty robust evidence base. Yeah, it? yeah. So I can I can give you some figures if you want. <laughs> Let's do the numbers, <laughs> Helen. Let's have some numbers. Um, well, we 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 what we did was um, we looked at inclusion exclusion criteria, and we looked at um, the sorts of inclusion criteria that other studies had done, and we picked out particular ones that we thought were the most vulnerable uh, people. So we didn't take people with eating disorders because that's a specialist uh, specialist service for, it's yeah. obviously it's part of a somatic complaint, but it's a specialist service. We didn't take people with learning difficulties, diagnose learning difficulties, because again, that's a specialist area. So we had various, um, we didn't have anybody who was under a consultant psychiatrist for the last 12 months, for example. Mm. So we had particular a particular target group, and then we measured their levels of symptom distress before the group started, after the group finished, which was a 12-week, uh, uh, two-hourly intervention. And then we waited for three months for the research and six months for the delivery um, practice-based research. And we've, we, we measured the, the symptom distress again. Um, Control group? We, sorry? Control group? 
we didn't have a control group, which was a shame. We should have used a waiting list, but we weren't we weren't well advised at that point because it was just feasibility at that point. That was one of the early ones, though, right? I mean, yeah. In this little yeah. while now. But yeah. we looked. We did look at anxiety and depression, and we used the same outcome measures as um, in, increasing access to something. To- IAP service or now called well-being services used and we use the measure your own med- medical profile which is a self-report uh, screening tool that, that patients use to rate their own uh, symptom distress and their own um, well-being levels. Yeah I just want to highlight to listeners this is really quite radical when I heard of you doing this I was so happy because it's not my area I'm not a researcher or an academic but I was really happy someone was doing this because I thought it's a lot we all know embodiment stuff's good stuff and we've got lots of personal stories and anecdotes and client stories but in the kind of modern world which as you said earlier privileges science and academia and evidence base um and you know this is the the way that cabins in open things up that you need to do studies you need to have things that are there and again not my job but glad you're doing it it's like someone there that's saying look we've actually measured these things and there's a 20 percent reduction in this or 50 percent increase in that and that's what convinced people you know ironically in a disembodied world this subjective experience of the body is not convincing yes. you need yes. that and there's a kind of irony to what you're doing in a way it, there is and it's very difficult though because without a randomized controlled trial yeah. nobody in in the nhs or even the nice guidelines will actually look at what you're doing seriously i mean they might pay lip service to it we did get some contracts in the nhs but really you need a randomized controlled trial and in order to have a randomized controlled trial you you need you need to make applications to funding bodies in competition with life-saving interventions for example yeah. Yeah. And these, these, although these people you know, some of some people who have uh, medically unexplained symptoms reach a point where they feel like they would like to take their life because their life is so yeah. awful. Yeah. M- most of the time, it's not it's not life threatening. So it's it's a difficult to get the funding because of because of that, and b because there's less funding around. It's hugely competitive. Yeah. What funding there is, and c you need to have a lot of very good connections in the NHS and actually be working probably in the NHS. So I'm going to jump in to the listeners. I'm jumping in. The NHS is the National Health Service, so that's yeah. Uh, yeah. One yeah. of the largest organisations in the world that's responsible for health and the NICE, it's the National Institute of Clinical, Clinical Excellence. Health Excellence. Yeah, they sort of say this treatment is good for that, right? That's their yeah. Treatment. They give they give all the drugs that, are, that are, have had RCTs, randomised controlled trials for, you know, this intervention, this drug works for this, and this one works for this, and so it gives the guidance. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been trying for what fifteen years now to get a big RCT underway and. Yeah, I, it's just I'm just one person. I just randomized controlled you know, trial, I guess. I'm yeah, <laughs> you need a big team, and you, you know it's it's very very difficult, very very difficult. So in a very small way, we've done some very small, very cautious studies, which do lead us to perhaps give a little bit of evidence that a starting point. Someone else needs to take yeah. it up, really, but it's a starting point um, for you know making this available. In a in a bigger way, scaling it up across the country and across the world, and so on. We have you know people like Oslem. You know, you were mentioning her earlier. She has done something in business where she's got some very good results from a a small um, randomised control trial, and she has still got another study to do for her doctorate, which will be hopefully with more people from uh, the business community within. Um, occupational health because of course absenteeism and presenteeism as a result of these symptoms is extremely high yeah and yeah, comes the cost to businesses but the cost to businesses is enormous and a lot of big companies are becoming aware of this and are promoting well-being in within their company you know they're, they're offering things that promote people's well-being oh sure i mean it's the norm now you go to any kind of progressive company there's a juice bar and a gym and some of those meditation yes I mean, um, so why not? Why not? Way, but it's really it's spread now. It's spread. I was in East London the other day, and I was going just walking past the company. I could see some of the things they were doing inside these big open kind of plan offices, and um, you know, some it's easy to be cynical about that, but it's certainly an improvement from I'd say even ten years ago in terms. Definitely, of the- definitely, because it actually does save the money and it increases productivity. That's the important thing. People with these symptoms, well, you know, they will not be producing in the same way as if they didn't have them or could manage them better. Yes, and a why not? Why not an intervention to promote uh, well-being in, 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 in for, for, for these, uh, these people? That's, that's the when I when I sell a stress management workshop in a business, 
I say, okay, it'll be two thousand pounds or three thousand pounds for the day, and they raise their eyebrows, and I say, okay, what does it cost you to replace yes. an employee? What does yes. it cost you every day someone's off work? If I if this stress management workshop were to reduce the number of uh, absenteeism or presenteeism by ten percent, what is that worth to you? Definitely. And, you know, one figure from business is like it costs fifty percent of a person's annual salary to replace them. That's the standard figure in HR. Really? Yeah. One person that has this that's that's you know fifty thousand pounds salary has a heart attack. That's twenty five thousand pounds. Yeah. So surely forget about the human level because sometimes business does. Purely on a financial level, the numbers make sense. To they do, they do. And of course, we know that seventy five percent of people who go to um, the GP for the 10 most common symptoms, the GP has no explanation for those symptoms. How many, what percent was that? 75%. 75% people could go to the GP and the GP. With the 10 most common symptoms. Wow. Uh-huh. There's no explanation. Yeah. So the poor GP. It's, one in, it's one in five of GP, um, GP lists, GP practice lists. So it's, 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 yes, it's incredibly um, common. It affects women more than men. It, I don't know why that is, but you can make some speculations on that. It also affects non-native speakers more. I think Gabor Mate would probably have something to say about this in terms of um, uh, social structures, isolation, traumas, group identity. You know, I feel like that stuff, often on people's view of embodiment that I've seen, doesn't integrate enough the social sense. And being mm. part of, say, an immigrant population where you feel other, maybe subject definitely, to racism. Definitely, definitely. And, any, and also anybody who's travelled like um, refugees or migrants or asylum seekers who, who've, who've travelled to another country, they've come from a war-torn country, they're going to be traumatised. And one of the ways to express trauma, as we know, there is a connection between trauma and uh, somatization or medically unexplained symptoms. Yeah, so we know that connection time time again. And also early childhood experiences, adverse child experiences, ACEs as they're called. We know again there's a connection between ACEs, particularly in, in sexual abuse for women and uh, pelvic pain. But ACEs and um, somatization, again, we know from research that there are those connections. 50% of referrals to secondary care are for MUS. So sec, do you want to explain what secondary care is? That's the, secondary care, the, uh, the hospital consultant specialists. Yeah, yeah. So when you go to the doctors in Britain and they say, "Well, I don't know where you've got that rash," they put you, you know, they send you off. Dermatologist, to, yeah. And the dermatologist looks at the symptoms, goes, "Well, you know, does the test go? Well, I don't know what's wrong with you," and they've got no idea the fact that you were abused as a kid, and you know, that's that's the kind of way your body was kind of shouting its pain, expressing it, day. expressing it, yes. Yeah. Because, because the stress response, the adaptive stress response was triggered and then maybe another trauma happened or something else happened in their life to trigger that and, and, the, and the body held the anxiety, held that, you know, they got stuck in that kind of iterative cir- circular uh, process and there's nothing interrupting it. So they're sort of stuck in the fight flight, you know, so they might hyperventilate, might have breathing yeah. problems, they might have non-cardiac chest pain, um, they might have digestive problems, which again is part of the stress adaptive re- response, uh, you know, digestion. And So there's, lot, there's lots of connections. Uh, chronic stress we know is, is part of MUS, health worries is part of MUS, trauma is part of MUS, yeah. Also, attachment style is is linked to MUS. So there's some very nice work by um, Gwen Adshead and Guthrie, um, 2015 paper, where they link three particularly insecure attachment styles to um, uh, medically unexplained symptoms. And I was training GPs the other day and explaining to them that when they get some of these uh, people with MUS, they do need to take into account that there may be some insecure attachment do you want to say what attachment is? I know like any therapist out there will be deeply in it, but it's still not, you know, some people might think like it's a Buddhist thing or something. So what it, what is an attachment style? It's uh, well, healthy attachment is when, uh, uh, so between a primary caregiver and, and the, and the infant, the relationship is, if you like, a cementing of the bond between the primary caregiver and the infant. And once that, once that has been, developed and uh, sort of solidified that lays down the patterns for all our relationships throughout life actually like a template of how we do human relationship and if exactly. you've had so a the, do- the doctor care- girlfriend 
the doctor carer relationship is a special one and there could be some insecure attachment projected onto the doctor so the doctor becomes not okay you you can't help me you're inadequate you can't find out what's wrong with me so kind of an angry response and the doctor gets them frustrated because they can't find out what's wrong so yeah. it kind of builds and builds and builds and it doesn't become a very productive relationship or you might get the other insecure attachment where they're they're saying um i'm not i'm really not okay and yeah. The GP knows everything, but so you know, you 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 know everything. Tell me what what what's wrong with me. So there's all sorts of different projections can be put onto the GP that are not to do with the medical side, that are more to do with the relationship side. Yeah. So an insecure attachment is when the, that bond is fragmented in in different ways. For example, if if um I'm just thinking about somebody I know is if if um. If a child has a sibling in the family when they're born that's very, very ill, maybe chronically, terminally ill, and they're born into that, the primary caregiver is obviously distracted to some extent with this other sibling that's mm -hmm. dying. And, and that does affect the relationship with the, yeah. the, the, new, the newborn. Yeah. So that, that, that chronic illness during childhood can be seen as an adverse child experience. And that can, in some cases, become an insecure attachment where the, maybe the child feels like they were neglected to some extent. Yeah. For example, the, the, the new the new one that was born, because of course the attention was all on the the child who was so ill, or hospitalisation, you know, separation from primary caregiver, that could also become an insecure attachment if it wasn't well handled and managed, so that those those uh, bonding moments um, could continue. Mm -hmm. um, organic illness belief by patients, so you know, catastrophizing they've got the big C, for example, those kind of belief systems that are maybe supported by families and gps oh yes you must you must have something terrible wrong what with works you. helen what really works in terms of working with the body what do you find is really I, helpful for people that have some of this these things going on i think that what i think one thing is that this particular patient group is working in a group with uh, with with symptoms not necessarily the same symptoms but they've sort of got the same experience and this sense of belonging this yeah. sense of not being isolated anymore because you think you're the only one the gp can't find out what's wrong with you yeah this this development in the group through movement through working together maybe with some music synchronized movement together where they feel this sense of belonging increases their tolerance to pain increases their acceptance of symptoms and and helps people to begin to learn how to self-manage yeah so i mean I, I said this in another podcast we're one of the few cultures ever to have taken out tribal movement as both a bonding practice you know we many people yeah. are isolated in the modern world it's an alienated world and i've, I've yeah. certainly experienced in 12-step recovery the power of kind of groups you know group support in different ways um and the, the importance of self-regulation in that we self-regulate in a social context right yeah exactly exactly so that i think the group is hugely and i mean the feedback from me we also do a um an evaluation with patients feeding back and they all say the importance of the group the facilitated group it's not just a group or self-help group. it's a, a very well facilitated group and allowing them to move at their own pace and reflect on the movement and begin to symbolically represent those symptoms through their movement so you know, how does that symptom feel in your body is the starting point. But then how would you express that with your hands Got or it. with a posture, you know, and then taking that, well, what does that remind you of? You know, if you were to move that, how would it move across the floor, traveling across the floor? Or if it were to make a sound to go with the movement, how, what sound would it make? And so all of this is exploring. It's um, delving into and people begin to understand themselves through yeah. their symptom. Has it been hard to package some of this in the, in order to do a study, you need a certain amount of consistency, like Cabot Zim's, you know, eight week MBT, MBT, uh, mindfulness based stress reduction course. And, you know, all of what you're saying to me makes a lot of sense. I, you know, I've done some dance in therapy. I use some very similar principles in the embodied yoga that I do. Um, mm. However, there's a sort of diversity of practice in these fields of embodiment. Mm. And has it been difficult to sort of nail down a, because uh, in to do research, you, just to do, this is for listeners. Obviously, yeah. you know this, to do research, you can't just randomly do it the hell you want for eight weeks. No, 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 no. Exactly. Set intervention. Yeah. Well, one of the things we did do was to set a manual 
So it's not a recipe, but it is. It gives guidance to the facilitator, and they all have to be trained. There's a four-day training in in the body mind approaches, which is what we call this uh, particular intervention. And they and they have they have these themes that have been kind of frequently coming up out of the groups. And so we say at some point, when it's appropriate we this theme in or we this theme in so mm. one theme that comes up a lot is listening to your body yeah that's going to come up in anything learning to listen to your body so that's one thing caring for yourself you know just how you're sitting you just stood up just now you know yeah. you need to stretch notice that you know you need to twist you need to you need to have a rug over your legs you need to take your jumper off you know you need a drink of water whatever just be able to care for yourself and then the group support, the, the, um, because they've been through similar experiences in the NHS, there's a lot of sort of safety in that. You know, people feel this sense of belonging. So they feel, because they feel safe, they feel able to explore their symptoms and then to develop an action plan for self-regulation post-group. So we don't just drop them at the end of the group experience. They have a six-month action plan where they have small changes, where they're, they're then... Um, reminded through every six weeks through letters from the facilitator texts and emails about their action plan and they implement that for the next six months so they embody a new habit towards their symptoms yeah and it seems to me that embodiment and practice those two things are absolutely tied together every embodiment teacher i know talks about the power of practice whether it's strozy or Stuart hello or wendy palmer or whoever yeah. and um you know, that's something that's almost been forgotten in the medical world. That it's not just operations and pills, which I'm not against. There's a time and a place for, you know, I'm taking a mm. pill for a fungal toenail thing I have right now. So I'm against that. However, like practice seems to be one of the most important um, uh, interventions or things, you know, even perspectives that, that can be offered. Yes. And so just teaching them, for example, correct breathing. Sim something simple like that they often don't realize that they're not breathing from their abdomen they're just breathing in this top oh sorry about that in this top area you know of the of, of the chest and when they find out they can actually yeah, yeah, yeah. and you can learn that pretty quick right you can they can and then they, they then we give them home practice yeah. so in between the groups they're doing that for two minutes every day at a certain time every day they write down when they're going to do it and then they come back and they've practiced it then they've learned it and then it it's something they can do when they're in a traffic jam or when they're feeling stressed or before they go into a yeah, resistance to any of these ideas, Helen. Like, like I'm a pretty easy sell, right? Like, I'm in the same team. I'm on the same team as you, basically. Even if I'm the business <laughs> wing, you're the academic wing. We're we're kind of in the same political party. But um, I mean, do you get resistance from the kind of academic world, like with this movement staff or kind of people yeah. you're kooky or? You know, it's not an environment I think I'd want to be in, if I'm honest. Oh, it's, it, it can be, yeah, it can be seen as uh, probably a bit threatening and uh, you're a bit on, on, it, on the outside and, um, yeah, you've hit, you've hit something there, definitely. It's, it is difficult to bring the body in that sort of, that sort of way of being into academia. Um, one of the things I was talking with my, actually, my line manager just yesterday is very interesting uh, being asked what, what would be my next research that links to education because mm. I'm in a school of education and at the moment I'm doing a project on mental health and uh, academics and how they can support students because we've got lo lots more complex and lots lots more students with um, mental health concerns um one of the things I thought uh, I just put, put past him was um how can we um help uh, to deliver um more consciousness if you like of the body and nonverbal communication for professional development for academics. Yeah, so that was that yeah. was sort of thought about. Um, I, don't know, whether, I don't know whether to get there, but it, it wasn't rejected out of hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so who knows? Um, I might be. An well, academic thinking. friend of mine said, "My body just carries me from one lecture to another." Uh, the person is is my age. They're less than forty, and they're starting to develop serious physical health problems. Yeah. And if you look at the difference between me and him, I look ten years younger. And yeah. much better energy and much better health. And it's like, yeah. that's a Gavin, man, you've got to take this shit seriously. Just forget about all the sort of wins you'll get in terms of creativity and focus. And, you know, you know, what about just your basic health? It's like, do you want to see your grandchildren? You know? Mm. Oh, like, yeah. I really felt like, dude, you're really on a path here that's not going to, it's not a, he was saying to me like a joke, you know, when we were talking about, I hadn't seen him in a while since school and we we're talking about our careers. And I was like, man, that's, that's going to end badly. You know, yes, and um, you know, yes. 
uh, academia now there's all this research being done on embodiment. Yeah, so he's all the, he's sort on. of um, dissociating himself from his subjective body, isn't he? Yeah, right. he's saying it's you know? not important to him. But the other side of it is an over-identification with the body in that the body, if you've got medically unexplained symptoms, the body becomes your whole preoccupied sort of being in life. You know, that is who you are. Um, so identity and, and, and the symptoms are kind of conflated. And so they're very much tied together. So mm. there's, there's, a, an, an, there's an identity of I am a sick person or my quality of life is really poor or you know, I'm absolutely unable to have a baby or be in a relationship. Yeah. yeah, you know, that because, makes, because the that symptoms makes sense. become such, a, you know, such an important part of their life because it stops them doing so many things. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, let's paint a vision then. Like, at the moment, there's this sort of tricky time when Western culture is transitioning into integrating some of this stuff and there's some great gains being made and there's some resistance to that. Like, what would it look like 100 years from now if medicine, <laughs> academia and embodiment were, let's say, we'd won? You know, like, our, our kind of, this worldview, because I, I feel like so often it can feel like pushing a boulder uphill, whether it's me convincing <laughs> business people, the body matters and leadership, or you convincing academics. Like, what would that look like in 100 years if academia, medicine and embodiment were completely seamlessly integrated and we had an embodied national health service? Wow, that that's quite a vision you've got there. <laughs> well, I'm trying to have one. Like, let's, like I'm, yeah. I'm, it's kind of bold. Like, would you be up for that? Like, what might? Let's just play. Like, what might? That that play be? with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think first of all, I think everybody would have some sort of reflective space where they could reflect on their practice. You know, that 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 there needs to be. I mean, you know, some sort of oasis where people can go safely and in confidence and reflect on what they're doing and how they're um, paying attention or not paying attention to their if you like mindful body we need a life dojo right we need a sort of 21st <laughs> century dojo in the same way as a samurai would go to their sword master and kind of work on their personality and their enlightenment and all that you know stuff we need a sort of 21st century version of that yeah yeah an opportunity to pause and that be timetabled into their work you know so that yeah. they they could have that as part of their every office would have a dojo yeah and, and every doctor would be intimately connected with the dojos in the local <laughs> community yes yeah, so so health and well-being would be absolute paramount for the professionals who are serving you know the patient if you like that, yeah. that, that has to be you know well-being is kind of it's sort of a bit of an add-on at the moment and i yeah. think it has to be sort of central I think society, the speed of society, the acceleration and busyness of society is actually pushing what once was a luxury or a thing that you did after you got broken yeah. into like at the moment that we just, my own personal time, the week I'm having is so intense. The workload I'm having is so strong. I just was just chilling with my wife at lunchtime talking about this. I said, if I didn't do my morning meditation and my evening movement practice, I would die this week. Yeah. Like yes. now on the one hand, there's a potential enabling there that's dangerous. But on the other hand, it's almost like, I feel like that's quite indicative of the modern world in that it, the, the opportunity here is that the speed and the technology and all these things people complain about is necessitating a mindfulness mm. practice. Is necessitating yeah. The yeah, so, it, so the balance will shift back to directing attention to the body di without judgment, um, being, being, giving yourself permission to be an empathic observer to the self if you like or benign mm. um witness to the self which of course is the practice i the practice i do is authentic movement which 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 uh promotes that capacity yeah cultivate that mind, mindful state as much as much as is possible because obviously we can't be in it all the time but just to have that opportunity to pause and it also builds um it builds emotional re re self regulation and resilience which is going to be needed more and more as I think there's going to be more and more um, outside effects quite, coming in. Yeah. We're going to have to be humanitarian aid workers on resilience and they're on the sort of sharp end of things in war zones and refugee camps. Yeah. And increasingly what I was doing with them 10 years ago now feels necessary for the average office worker now because the environment has become so much more like a war zone. Um, wow. And wow. like that, that's my observation in the last 10 years, like 20 yeah. years, 15 years ago, I was in war zones and now everyone's in a war zone. 
that that's yeah. it's the same body even though there's not bullets flying there's the same feeling of you know everyone's been fired instead of killed yeah the same feeling of, of of scarcity and urgency and busyness and have to do it right now that i used to experience in those locations but actually actually yeah. it's sort of there's an old traumatized part of me that feels quite a home in the modern business because yeah. it's, it's like a war zone it's got the same soma the same feel right so this state of embodied mindfulness is even more important in even in in i think even without having a war zone you might say it's a mini war zone in some businesses yeah you know, in some right. universities even you still got the dynamics of the workforce university is brutal i hear these days i heard it's really changed since i was at university 20 years ago i heard it's rough well because of the whole change in like it's a consumer system now with the students having loans and paying fees and so on and it changes the whole purpose really behind under underpinning education and it's it's quite i was the last quite free year so i, I got in i was the last year of free university right you just in yeah yeah it's well lucky. now with the student finance uh you know finances they have to work obviously they have to have a full-time or part-time job whilst they're studying um, and also the widening d d diversity now of students we're getting, it's a much, much wider participation. So, of course, there's more complex, uh, can be more complex issues as a result of that. In fact, the literature I study, this is going off the point a little bit, but the literature study I did, um, review I did of studies shows that university students have more and more complex and are more frequently having mental health concerns than their non-university peers because the stresses they're under are greater mm. Mm. so something's got to shift there we, we've definitely got to help you know provide more for students at university for their um, mental health and their well-being what's, your, think, edge? what's your like practice edge helen in terms of um your own practice your own learning right now like, I don't know you well enough to guess. I'm, I'm curious, like, what's your, um, what are you coming up against personally? Well, I suppose the academic, you know, the, the idea that, don't talk about stress because then everybody says they're stressed. Mm. <laughs> so don't talk about stress management. It's so British, don't talk about it. <laughs> no, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. But you, you can talk about well-being. And I suppose one of the struggles I have is how to frame everything into uh, promoting well-being and resilience as opposed to managing symptoms and stress and so on mm -hmm. so that's a kind of refocus and you know because i'm in the school of education what i keep coming up again is, is how, how is that education how is that learning how is that you know well it's professional development and learning yes but how is it that so trying to make um a conceptual framework that fits with these the schools who are all separate all the schools are separate. established silos right they're all separate business units they're all completely um you know uh autonomous it's it's how to make those links for um it, it being it being acceptable you know it, the embodied lived body experience being acceptable within within a particular strategic business unit like education or it's easier in health, of course, and probably a bit easier in psychology. Well, I wouldn't say definitely, <laughs> but it's, it, it's, it is, that's what I'm coming up against. That's what I'm having struggles with mm. in my uh, academic life. Well, maximum respect for being on the front lines in academia and kind of putting this stuff out there. As I said, I was so happy when I heard someone was doing it. Part of me is kind of like, oh, I'd love to do that, but I know it's just not me. I know I'd hate being in that world. But uh, I was so happy and I'd, I'd love to see more uh, embodiment people, you know, get into research and looking at evidence base and, you know, really proving, yes. proving it. There's, you know, for anyone listening to this who's looking for a PhD, there's so many good ideas. You know, I have PhD ideas on a daily basis for the stuff. I'm just too busy selling them and teaching them to, you know, sit down <laughs> and find a 200 people for a clinical study. You know, it's not, it's not, my, it's not my bag. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, well, hopefully it'll be someone's bag. I mean, you know, everybody, horses for courses, yeah. you know, you're doing fantastic work within your particular niche. I think, you know, people do need to get into academia though. And, you know, it does need to be spread through, through health and, and psychology and, and education. Definitely. And the, and the medical sciences too. Cool. Well, it looks like we're coming to a kind of natural end here. Is there any kind of subjects you would have hoped to have talked about that we haven't touched upon? Oh, <laughs> you, your questions have been quite, uh wide ranging but also yeah. allowed me to say what i wanted to say i think i think <laughs> hopefully i'm looking about what you sent me before 
uh, self management. Oh, I can't outcomes, remember what I said. You from countrywide delivery. What is MSU? Yeah, I think we covered the main stuff that you said was your sort of major interest at the moment. Um, hmm. Attachment, yeah, attachment and medically unexplained symptoms. This is what I'm into at the moment. Great. Well, it feels like we're coming to a natural end here. Yeah. Um, if we're, feel free to plug your books and where people can find <laughs> out about you. Or do you need PhD students? Like, like just, just what do you need? Oh, well, yeah, I, I suppose I could say um, that the new book coming out in November is, is uh, quite a seminal text. It's uh, the Routledge International Handbook on Embodied Approaches or on Embodied Perspectives in Psychotherapy. And that's 40 odd chapters from people all over the world who are actually cutting edge in research theory and practice, um, disseminate, disseminating their work. And so that will be published in, in November. So people could maybe make a note of that. Um, in, in terms of PhD students, I've got my quota at the moment. I'm just interviewing <laughs> another one in July who wants to work with refugees, actually, using TBMA okay. with refugees in Berlin. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've, I'm only allowed so many. You're only allowed so many, uh, you know, so many at a time. So it's a competitive process. But, yeah, always open to people writing with their... Where can people find you online? What's the best website to catch you on? Is it... Um, I, I've got a research profile from Hearts University, Hearts University in front of me. Is that the best one or some, somewhere else? What's the best website? Yeah, either, either the profile at UH or the School of Education website. Um, yeah, I also deliver um, residential, intensive, authentic movement um, courses um, three times a year. So if anybody's interested in that area, um, be happy to hear from them. Um, I'm, I'm running one in, in Switzerland in in August, and another one here at retreat actually at five days retreat in September. Um, yeah. The House of Pain. Yeah. <laughs> you get lots of jokes about your name. Given what you do, I mean, I've been, I've resisted for an hour, Helen. I think it's time. I, you know, I don't think I can hold back that dam any longer. Like, 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 do you get lots of jokes with the, with the, you know, the, you're, you're dealing with MSU and your name is Pain? I mean, like, <laughs> I don't actually. I'm you sure people don't. You need more cheeky people like me around you, clearly. I think people well, think it, but they don't say. They don't say I it. Oh, I, I, the felt, uh, the felt was broken with me. It's been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it myself. Yeah, it's quite ironic, isn't it? <laughs> this is great. Helen, you're one of my heroes. I think you're fantastic. I really love what you do. If you ever need support or things putting out there, then just, just oh, let me know. I that's feel kind like of you. Like, Thank you. You're an unsung hero. And were you a loud American, you'd be much better known. And what, you, what you're doing is really important. I think it's groundbreaking in terms of embodiment um, to have anyone doing studies and, you know, in, in this field and, and much, much needed. Um, and as I said, I'm glad I'm not doing it because it doesn't look fun, but uh, it does look neat. No, it is. It's very creative and it's really rewarding. It's, it, it's not really fun with it. I'm glad you have fun with it. <laughs> well, I see myself not really as an academic or researcher. I see myself as a practitioner. Yeah. Learning, learning more about practice. You can only learn about practice by researching it, really. Yeah. Yeah. Doing it and researching it. So, that, yeah, I enjoy it. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, this hasn't been a pain in the ass. Um, oh, this thank been, you. This has, been, this has been fun. And um, final message. So, what's a parting message about the body for our listeners? Um, just uh, being in the movement moment as much as you can. Really, um, paying attention, kind attention to yourself and your subjective experience in your body, um, and expressing yourself through that interactive relationship between body and mind. Helen Payne, thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embodied Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body.